What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health, Tuesdays, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern, on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJLPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD in Kasilof and Anchorage, Alaska. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project, streaming, podcasting, and archived at madnessradio.net. This is Madness Radio. I'm your host, Will Hall. And today our show is going to be talking about um, hoarding people who um, collect so much stuff in uh, their homes or in their lives that it starts to become a real um, problem and they need help. And we have a um, professor of psychology from Smith College on the line with us from Northampton, Massachusetts. And his name is um, Randy Frost. And Randy has written a number of books on hoarding. He's written a treatment manual for therapists, and he's written a self-help book called Buried in Treasures. He has a book that's coming up soon for the general public about hoarding. So thanks a lot for joining us today on Madness Radio, Randy Frost. Hi, well, nice to be on the show. Yeah, and um, this is an issue that's interesting to me. I have um, sort of my own um, kind of experience uh, with kind of too much stuff that starts to create problems. I don't think it's a real serious problem, but it's something I've thought about a little bit. And I've had some friends who've had really some real problems with what would be called hoarding. And I know that your work has been trying to really um, update and improve um, the way that professionals look at this issue and to try and get a better sense of what it's really all about for people. So um, uh, tell us just about how you personally got involved uh, with this issue, how you got interested, and then sort of what what really is the experience of people who are um, are having problems with hoarding? Well, hoarding is something that for many years we knew virtually nothing about. And about 15 years ago, I was teaching a class on obsessive compulsive disorder at Smith uh, seminar, uh, which is an area of research uh, for me. And uh, during the course, during the seminar, one of the students asked about hoarding. Hoarding is was thought to be a symptom of obsessive compulsive disorder, although one that doesn't happen very often. And uh, she asked a question about it, um, and I didn't know anything about it. And uh, we, I, so I, I suggested that we look in the literature, and in the literature we found virtually nothing about it. So we thought it, it would be a useful exercise to see if we could find someone with a hoarding problem to interview uh, as part of a um, project for the seminar. So we put an ad in the local newspaper. Uh, Northampton is a town of about 30,000 people, and, and we thought we might be able to, to find one or two people who would agree to be interviewed. We asked for people who were pack rats or chronic savers. And to our surprise, we got over 100 telephone calls. And when that happened, um, we thought there must be something here that everyone's been missing. And so we, we started with that group of 100 people, and uh, that really set off our research on hoarding. So what sort of was the um, definition of hoarding that you use? I mean, I know that um, in the approach that the, the show takes and a lot of the um, um, perspective that we have on mental health issues, is often a, a gray area, and you can't really pin down specific diagnoses or specific um, boundaries, but what is sort of your definition of the kinds of people that you were interviewing and, and um, what you would be considering hoarding? Well, there, there are three features uh, that, that make up a, a definition of hoarding. The first is a description of the behaviors. The behaviors include an, the acquisition of and failure to discard or let go of a large number of possessions. That behavior or those, that set of behaviors describes probably many of us, where we, we all collect lots of things. Uh, so it's, that part of it is, is not necessarily problematic. But when the other two features come in, when the problem arises, and, and the second feature is that the, the, that number of possessions, all those possessions, clutter the living spaces to such an extent that they can't be used for their intended purposes. Uh, And then the third feature is that either the clutter or the difficulty with acquisition or discarding produces a significant amount of distress or interference uh, in in the person's life. 
So the first, the behavior is just a behavior, maybe an eccentricity, but just a behavior, and it's only pathological when the clutter interferes with people's ability to live, and when the uh, the the the, act, the behaviors cause significant distress or impairment. Now, sometimes that distress and impairment might affect people around the person. Um, a number of people with hoarding problems don't quite recognize them or don't quite think of them the same way that other people do. Uh, and sometimes that gets in trouble, them in trouble with their neighbors, with the health department, with uh, elder services uh, officers and so forth. What are some examples of hoarding and people that you've worked with? Well, um, people who hoard um, tend to save all kinds of, of things. And we, we've seen people in our treatment program who save... Um, uh, I guess the, the most frequent items are newspapers and magazines, uh, lots and lots of containers of various kinds, bags, boxes, uh, plastic containers, and so forth, uh, ostensibly in an effort to get organized. Um, but um, often they become part of the clutter as well. Uh, so we see all of these things now, and th there are a number of different reasons why people save things. Um, but it, in, in terms of hoarding, to give you a sense of what it's like, there, there are three major manifestations of it. The first is acquisition. There's an excessive level of acquisition that's different than, than the norm, so that um, people either, either tend to buy excessive amounts of things, and be unable to control their buying, or they um, collect free things uh, in an excessive way, much more so than other people do. Uh, as an example, um, we had uh, 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 one of our first cases was a woman who um, couldn't walk by a newsstand because when she saw a newsstand, she would think to herself, look at all those newspapers and all those magazines somewhere in all of that, there is a piece of information that could change my life. How can I walk away and not take advantage of that opportunity? And it became so difficult for her that, that if she saw a newsstand, she was walking along, she'd have to cross to the other side of the street and look away just to avoid it. Randy, that's, so that, very, that's very interesting. That relates to, um, I don't know if I want to call them hoarding hoarding tendencies, <laughs> but it relates a, relates a little bit to my own experience. Um, I, I just moved about 50 boxes from the East Coast to the West Coast, just a lot of stuff that I had um, stored. And one of the reasons that I kind of was hanging on to all this is because I would look at it and I would see newspapers, papers, like old to-do lists, old junk mail that I've gotten, all kinds of stuff that I think a lot of people would have just thrown out. Um, and I'm looking at it, and the feeling that I'm getting and the um, the attitude that I'm having to it is related to what you just described. I'm feeling like there's something important in there. There's something that I really need to look over, and I better hang on to this because later I'm going to get a chance to sort out sort it out and find that thing that's so important. And then kind of like later doesn't actually really really come. <laughs> in my case, it, it actually is coming. I'm kind of getting my my act together a little bit, but it sounds like it's a related kind of thing that I've experienced. Exactly, exactly. In, in some ways, w w we've thought about this as maybe a disorder of opportunity, where people see opportunities in things that they will never be able to take advantage of, like the information in all those newspapers and all those magazines. And it's like they can't give up the opportunity. As, as we all go through life, we, we realize, or, or, or even if we don't realize it, we do it automatically. We, whenever we make one decision, we're taking advantage of one opportunity and we're giving up other opportunities. But our tendency is always to forget about the other opportunities and pursue the one that we've chosen. Uh, but people who hoard, it's like they, 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 they can't give up those opportunities and they want to keep all of them as possibilities. The unfortunate thing is that by doing so, they rule out being able to take advantage of any of them. Um, what about another kind of aspect of this? Um, and I'm not going to mention the, the person's name, but it's a, a friend of mine who was living in a pretty pretty small apartment, and um, she just wouldn't get rid of anything. I mean, if she would, 
if there was any garbage that she had, if she had fast food wrappers or she had um, bottles of drinks or um, anything that she had brought in, it never left the apartment. And pretty soon, you know, you couldn't see the floor. You would kind of wade through this sort of sea of just garbage and stuff. And she also had tons of books and files and all kinds of of things. And it seems like that's um, there's like a neglect side of that, someone who's just not sort of taking care of themselves. Um, is that another aspect of it, or is that a different experience that can result in the same kind of clutter phenomenon? Well, there, there are several features of, of what you described that are related here. One is that the, the saving of, of garbage or, or things that most people would, would absolutely throw out, and, and exactly the, the nature of this depends on what the person would have to say about these things. Most often in hoarding cases, when we see someone who is saving this kind of stuff and we ask them questions about it, they're, they're unable to throw it away because they're not quite certain that something useful hasn't gotten attached to that trash, so they can't make that decision. And, and that's much a, a form of hoarding that's much closer to classic obsessive-compulsive disorder, where there is such uncertainty about um, a, 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 a situation and such feelings of uh, threat if a mistake is made in throwing out something that might have something valuable in it. So in, in that sense, it's possible that this particular case is, is really a form of OCD. The rest of the hoarding cases we see where people save stuff that isn't junk tend to be somewhat different than obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, so that's one, one feature of this, of this problem. The, the other feature has to do with um, people who live in conditions that are unsanitary. Um, and, and sometimes, especially if, if uh, someone has a problem with uh, depression or dementia or something like that as they age, there is a, a drop in motivation to do something. So, so another possibility is that uh, depending on the person's life circumstance, is this really a failure of motivation, motivation to actually get up and, and, and take care of this stuff and throw this stuff out. Uh, in that case, it wouldn't necessarily be hoarding because it, it, it's not that the person has a difficult time throwing things out. It's that they simply don't have the motivation or the energy to do so. And then it would be much more of a depression kind of phenomena than, uh, than straight hoarding. Now, I think a lot of the listeners, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm really interested in this in this topic. This is one of the reasons I invited you on the show. But a lot of our listeners might be kind of scratching their heads and saying, well, Will, you know, Madness Radio is really about getting away from this idea of pathology and what's normal and what's not normal and just kind of really respecting different people's realities based on, you know, what it, what it means to them rather than creating a a line that you, if you cross it, you're unhealthy, and if you if you're inside of it, then you're considered healthy. And the the definitions that you sort of presented, um, you said the failure to let go of a large number of stuff isn't really the kind of the defining feature here. The defining feature here is that it disrupts a living space's purpose and also creates distress. Now, I guess my question is, aren't isn't that really subjective? I mean, don't you find that? You know, yourself, you might have one opinion about a client and they say, oh, well, that's clearly um, hoarding. And then maybe another professional equally as uh, qualified as you might say, well, actually, that person is just eccentric or, well, you know, I mean, it's disruptive, but it's not really that disruptive. Or other people maybe can't come over to the person's living room, but they seem to be OK with it. I mean, do you think that you in this area that it's. A, um, a lot of room for there being a lot of ambiguity about what we're what we're dealing with. Well, I think I, I, what we see with this with this behavior is a range that goes all the way from uh, not at all to very severe, and it's really the severe cases we're talking about. It, it, it doesn't really matter how much stuff any of us have, and it doesn't really matter how we keep that stuff, as long as it doesn't interfere with our ability to live. But if, if we have so much stuff that we could easily die in a fire because, we, because there's a lot of fuel to, to flame the fire or the, uh, we can't get out 
um, because the exits are all blocked or the firemen put themselves at risk by trying to come into a home like that, then you start to get into a situation that's, that's pretty difficult. And that's really when, when that line gets crossed with whether this is a problem or not. Um, and, and so whether it's, we call it a disorder or, or a problem in living, is, is it, it's sort of crossed there where this presents a danger of some kind. Um, so what we try to do when we deal with this problem is focus on, on the extent to which this causes distress or impairment. And the impairment's got to be pretty extreme in order for this to be uh, uh, considered something we need to do something about. Yeah, I'm also thinking about, um, you know, you <coughs> mentioned the health concerns, um, you know, fire being a, a concern. And I mean, a lot of people create fire hazards in their in their homes or their apartments for all kinds of different reasons. But another issue is also the issue of like of, of neglect of animals and people who suddenly have, you know, 50 cats in their home because they've been um, they've been breeding and they're just sort of neglected. And this is that a, it sounds to me like you're describing something that's really kind of a different dynamic that someone who gets into that kind of situation is really dealing with more of a neglect and a, a, just a difficulty kind of taking care of their basic their basic day-to-day -day reality is that is that right yeah although when we, when we look carefully what we find is that people who are at that level tend to save things for exactly the same reason that everyone else does um, there, there seem to be three general kinds of r rationales for saving things. One is sentimental or emotional, that things are reminders of events, persons, or, or places that are important in the person's life. The second are instrumental, that is, things that you need. Um, I need the, my, my driver's license, for instance, those kinds of things. And the third are things that are safe for intrinsic reasons. It's not that they're, they have any significant emotional value or instrumental value, but they just the person just likes them. And these are three reasons why everyone saves things, and it's also the reasons basically that people who have problems with hoarding save things. So in that sense, it's not at all unusual. What is more, what is unusual is the the range of things that are assigned these kinds of value. So, for example, a sentimental value. One of the one of our early clients, <clears throat> we were working with her once, trying to clean, help her clean up um, her um, her TV room. She picked up an, a five year old ATM envelope. It, the envelope was empty, but on the back of it, she had written what she used the money for. And it wasn't anything all that unusual, the drugstore, the grocery store, a few other items. <clears throat> and she, she put it in the uh, recycle box, and she started to cry. <clears throat> and what she said was that she, she felt as though part of her was dying by throwing this mm. ATM envelope away. And, and then she said, and if, if I throw too much away, there'll be nothing left of me. So this one little envelope is something that came to be part of her identity, part of who she felt she was, and part, partly something that was a tangible um, um, aid to memory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and it's almost as though that thing carried with it that particular day in her life. Well, I can really, I can really personally relate to that. I don't, um, you know, I don't have any of the kind of extremes of the people that you're talking about, but there are a lot of things that I've just put notes on. Um, like for example, like directions, um, someone gives me directions to go to a certain place and it really, for me, it has this, like you said, a sentimental value. And, and in this process of moving my, um, stuff from the East coast to the West coast, a lot of it is work related because so much of my, um, files and books were in my, stuff but clearing them some of that stuff out was really was very emotional for me because it did feel like um you know losing a part of myself or disappearing um and it was very much tied to memory and and um, feelings and maybe other people wouldn't understand that and i know in my own personal story I mean, i left um i left home pretty young uh, i was 15 basically didn't really um go back and a lot of the the um personal items that were part of my own inner world as a kid kind of got lost in the um, process of me leaving home and my dad 
moving our family, moving around. And do you find that people who attach a really strong sentimental meaning and value to things that might seem like scraps or insignificant to other people, do you find that they often have a personal story behind that that um, is related to some sense of loss of home or loss of, of their sense of belonging, belonging in the world? Well, originally, one of our hypotheses was that maybe people who, who suffered from this were, were people who had experienced a period of material deprivation early in life. Like, uh, you hear stories of people who lived through the Depression or the Holocaust. Uh, and so it's one of the first hypotheses we, we tested and found no evidence for it. So people who had this kind of behavior and had this kind of problem weren't any more likely to have lived through a period of material deprivation than, than people who, who didn't. So it, was, it wasn't just the, the availability of things. Uh, there was a little bit of evidence that it might be associated with some kind of emotional deprivation or emotional loss, certainly in life, but even that is, is sort of preliminary at this point. But, it, but it, it, the interesting thing about it is that we all do this to some extent, but people with this problem do this with everything. So even seemingly innocuous things that come into their life, it's like as soon as it enters their sphere, it, it gets tagged with this, this kind of sentimentality, this kind of identity, this kind of memory. And that's the part, I think, that is, that is so interesting here. What is it that, that leads people to do that? And it might be that, that for some people, there is a visceral memory that is associated with objects that other people don't have much of. So that, uh, you know, some people could, could uh, maybe write a description of this day and what was purchased with this ATM envelope and feel fine about letting go of the envelope. And other people can't because it's, it's the, the, the sight of the envelope, the shape of the envelope, that, that visceralness that brings back the, the real feeling associated with that particular day. So that's, that's a part of what's very interesting about this phenomenon. And, and, and there are several other things that are, that are interesting about it having to do with uh, what is what people pay attention to with respect to objects, um, and it, it looks like people who who hoard pay attention to unusual details of objects, uh, and and often they have to do with the intrinsic value. <clears throat> One of our early clients, I've been working with her for some time, and. Uh, when I showed up at her home one day, she, she her eyes lit up, and she said, I've, I've got to show you something. And she ran into the next room and came back with a, a clear plastic ba bag, a large one, filled with bottle caps. And what she said was, look at these bottle caps. Aren't they beautiful? The shape and the color. And w what what it showed is is her focus on those details of the bottle caps that I would never focus on and most people would not focus on. Bottle caps without an associated bottle are trash um, to most people, but for her there was some value in the shape and the color. And this, this has led us to think a little bit about the way in which people process information about objects. And it appears as though people who hoard may be more creative than the rest of us because they they can see the uniqueness in objects and they they see things that the rest of us don't and those things that they see give the object value that the rest of us can't see if you're just joining us this is madness radio i'm your host will hall and uh, today on Madness Radio, we are speaking with Randy Frost, who is a psychology professor whose research focuses on uh, compulsive hoarding, hoarding being people who uh, collect so much stuff in their lives, in their homes, it starts to become a hazard and problem for them and other people. Yeah, this is very much related to what I was talking about um, uh, before, about the sort of relativity of this. And we may really be, as we often are, when we're looking at uh, mental health, um, be looking at an issue of mental diversity, that it's a certain group of people are different than others and have a different relationship to things, and their inner world is going to be different related to those b bottle caps than other people's inner world. What, what is it that people say? Um, do people, if they describe a part of their lives or something that's beautiful about the object, um, do they have any other explanation in terms of like why they feel this way towards something, whereas other people 
Um, don't what are do people have individual theories of why they might be different or how their difference came into being in the world or are people kind of puzzled that other people don't um, have the same kind of attitude I mean I sometimes look at other people's lives and all their stuff is new and they don't have collections of old things and they haven't been keeping and safeguarding and collecting things I'm kind of sort of puzzled myself like what you don't have stuff from when you were you know <laughs> in this period of your life you were living there you didn't collect stuff from that and i think it's sort of like a a personal point of view or a personal attitude that we have but what is it that people say themselves about why they might have this difference well i think i think a lot of uh, what a, a lot of people's experience people who hoard they they don't really think much about it except when they reflect on it they think of themselves as detail people and not whole picture people and, and this is a, a piece of this in, in, in that they get lost in the details of an object and it's difficult for them to take a step back and abstract the Im- most important features of an object or the most relevant features of an object. They notice the aesthetic features of an object and so they, they get kind of stuck there. And, and so the, the, the question of w- what they do with it then it's kind of interesting because it goes back to what I was talking about earlier with uh, opportunity, that if I see the shape and the color of these bottle caps, that sets off in my mind all kinds of questions about what, what can be done with this shape and color. So I might think of keeping the bottle caps to make some kind of collage. I might think of keeping the bottle caps to show someone who I think might like them or, you know, so, so these, these kinds of purposes then enter the person's life. The difficulty is that this happens with so many things that none of these purposes get achieved. So I may have these bottle caps, I put them away and I keep them, but I never make that collage. I never get them to the person that wants, I wanted to show them to because in the meantime, some other opportunity has come up and some other possession has come up. So in a sense, it, it may be that, that we're seeing some form of creativity here, but it's an ineffective form of creativity um, uh, in that n- nothing gets produced. Now, there's some, some aesthetic pleasure that's derived, and, and perhaps that's a purpose enough. Uh, but that pleasure is often, unfortunately, offset by the by the difficulties in living in these circumstances. It also may be a um, seems like it may be a, a sort of delayed creativity that one person's collection <coughs> might get uh, discovered later on in life by that person, or maybe even discovered by um, their children. Or, I mean, I know that historians are often looking through trash and finding all sorts of <laughs> really valuable, interesting things right. and, and I think we're on to this <coughs> question of creativity do you think that there is um, a relationship because I know that you know a lot of the artists um, that I know are collectors of all sorts of things um, a lot of them have pretty chaotic um, living spaces by sort of normal mainstream standards but do you think that have you seen in the work that you've done that often people have maybe they're not creating art in a traditional sense but they have a creative take on the world and they have that kind of spark of creativity that's part of their difference uh, absolutely and and there are people who who's who seem to be able to harness it the, the person who comes to mind most readily is uh, andy warhol who who whose home in new york city was absolutely stuffed with things he could only use a couple of rooms uh, and he had uh, many warehouses filled with things and and he would do um, he, he would say virtually everything. In fact, every few weeks, he would take everything that was on his desk, um, cash, uh, apple cores, uh, important papers, paintings. He'd pull it off of his desk and put it into a box, seal it, date it, and then put it in storage. And these treasure chests are, are, are just now being uncovered. At the, they're, I think they're all stored at the Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh. And it, so he was, he was an example of someone who had a lot of this behavior, whether or not it constituted a, a problem or not is unclear, but, but he was able to take advantage of that and use it as part of his art. 
Randy, earlier you mentioned <coughs> that you put out this um, newspaper advertisement with your students expecting a few responses and you got just an overwhelming response. And I'm, I'm curious whether you think that um, this phenomenon of being a pack rat or um, hoarding or collecting excessively, do you think that it's um, really tied to changes in the culture? Are we seeing more of this now than we did in the past? Well, it's unclear whether this is increasing in frequency or not. We, we certainly hear more about it now. It's in the news a lot now, and it never was before. Although, if you go back enough years, in the, in the uh, 1940s, late 1940s, there was a very famous case in New York City that made all the papers and made the papers for weeks um, where there were two uh, two eccentric brothers who lived in, in Harlem, and they had absolutely packed their home, and, and it eventually collapsed on uh, on them, and they both died. And and this was in uh, was quite an ordeal and uh, uh, quite an event in the, in the history of, uh, of New York. And now, uh, in terms of culture, it's it certainly is the case that our culture is one where there is a lot of easily accessible and uh, inexpensive stuff to be had. And so it is relatively easy to collect a lot of things. And that perhaps wasn't the case 50, 60 years ago. So it's, it's very likely that we're seeing more of it now because of the availability of, of things and the, the amount of money that it takes to acquire those things. We do see some cultural aspects. There, uh, hoarding is related to materialism, but there are some key differences. People who are highly materialistic uh, enjoy um, displaying the things that they have because it's part of their their identity. But but in hoarding, it's a little bit different. Yes, yeah, part of people's identity, but for the most part, people who hoard hide their possessions from other people, and that's because um, of the way in which those possessions are organized and kept. And people who hoard ha- experience great shame. Uh, as a function of how their how their living conditions are, and we'll, we'll try to hide them uh, from other people, um, and go to great lengths to do so. That's interesting. That's uh, about the availability of of stuff. That's kind of an interesting. That's a little bit different direction than I was thinking of in terms of um, of you know is this changed historically or what's happening now compared to the past. What about other cultures? Have you done any kind of comparison of, um, say, Canada or European cultures or Asian cultures or different countries around the world where this, um, you know, phenomenon might be different? I know that there are a lot of things that we sort of accept as being part of just being human, like eating disorders and anorexia. But actually, if you look cross-culturally, it's very different. The rates are very different depending on what kind of society that you live in. So how is that um, true or not true in terms of, of, of hoarding? Well, we're not entirely sure. We, it, there aren't very many prevalent studies, so we, d- we can't really compare rates across cultures. But we do see hoarding behaviors in most cultures, and they seem to be related uh, in pretty much the same way in those cultures. We've done some research in uh, uh, Europe. There are other researchers in the UK uh, working on this, Australia. Uh, there's a, a study out of uh, Hong Kong, another out of uh, China, one out of Japan, Malaysia, and and all of them, the phenomena looks quite similar to what we see here. So it appears as though this is something that that yeah, there may be some cultural variations in the nature of the things kept, but for the most part, there's there's something about this uh, set of behaviors that's fairly common. And there are some other. Um, sort of subcultural issues, and one of them is uh, is gender. It looks like there may be some differences in the nature of things saved between men and women. That uh, women are more likely to save uh, clothes as a as a major item, and men are more likely to save things that they can fix or tinker with. And we also think that men may be a little bit less likely to be able to recognize the problematic nature of what they're doing. Now, I want to talk about um, how to help people and what kinds of um, recommendations that you have um, for people who might be concerned about someone that they know or, or professionals. I know that you've been an advocate for um, very compassionate kind of working 
with people. Um, but I'm, I'm also wondering whether you think, because we live in a society that's really pretty um, crazy when it comes to diagnosing. Um, everybody's got a diagnosis these days. Turn on the TV. You want to get a diagnosis. People are diagnosing themselves or diagnosing I- each other. Do you think there's a danger of people listening to this program and saying, oh, well, I, uh, God, I, I have a whole cache of stuff and I bring it home and I keep a huge collection. Maybe I have this problem. Maybe I have this um, disorder. Do you think that that's, um, that there's a danger there? Because I think that as we've been discussing, there are also really very human and creative and positive sides to this as well. Yeah, I, I think certainly when, when I talk about this work to other people, where other people find out what I do, they, they often uh, suggest that they themselves may have some of this. And I think that's simply because as when you hear about the behaviors and, and the way in which people make decisions about saving things, we all do some of this. And so it's a perfectly normal response. And, and so lots of people uh, have, the, have the notion when they, when they first hear about it that maybe they have a bit of this problem. But as I said earlier, it's not really a problem until it gets to the point that there's so much stuff that it's interfering with the ability to live. I think beyond that, the, the issue of, of disordered or not, there's, there's another layer that's, that's somewhat problematic for people who do this. Um, people who, who engage in this behavior um, often feel that other people are judging them because of it. And, and they make assumptions about them simply being lazy uh, and unmotivated. And that is, is not the case for someone who has a hoarding problem. It is, it's more of a feeling of being driven to hang on to this stuff. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the flip side, that, that people need to understand that this isn't just a behavior that involves someone not doing something they should be doing or, or, or being too lazy to, uh, to take care of their, of their home. Uh, Randy, is, is uh, poverty a factor here as well? Because I imagine if someone has like lots of space, <laughs> they might be able to collect more without it becoming a fire hazard. Well, we do see more of this problem in people who have lower levels of income. But we, we still see a significant number of people who have high incomes who engage in this behavior. Um, and in fact, when, when we've seen people in treatment, oftentimes we get people who own three, four, five houses, and they'll fill up one house and they'll move to the next one. And uh, granted, for a while, they move into a new space and it's relatively uncluttered. And so have they gotten rid of the problem or not? Well, they may have gotten rid of the problem of, of, of living in that situation, but they um, what happens is they fill up the, the next house in relatively short order. So what we found, if someone has the problem, they'll fill up whatever space is available. It just happens more quickly if they have only small spaces available. And maybe if they have the economic means, if they're wealthier, they can maybe continue their um, hoarding and collecting without it maybe becoming uh, right. distressful right. or difficult for other people. Um, well, let's um, let's talk a little bit about um, this question. <laughs> There's always a word that I, I really I just don't like it at all called intervention, and it, it's sort of like someone doesn't get it, and so other people around them kind of push them to get it or they leverage whatever it is they can leverage against the person. And I've, you know, I've been reading a little bit about the kinds of things that you recommend and how you um, work with people and work with professionals. And, and, um, I know that there's a, there's a danger that if you sort of bust in and uh, clear out somebody's stuff or you force them to do this, that, or the other thing, you can actually create much bigger problem than you started out with. And that is especially, I think, true in the case of, of elderly people, um, who may need their sense of security in their environment to be treated very delicately. And if suddenly all their stuff is gone and they lose something that's very important, it can be really quite um, quite devastating. So talk to us a little bit about how you approach that. That's right. It, w- traditionally, what has happened with people who, who get in trouble with hoarding behavior is the health department will come in and tell people they have to clean, clean the place up to meet code. And if they don't, 
and if this goes on for long enough, sometimes the health department will come in and and uh, declare the home uninhabitable, and we'll move the person out, and we'll take a crew in and clean the stuff out. Uh, this is something that that we think is is quite damaging to the individual. Uh, what happens is that you improve the conditions in the home for a short period of time, but you do nothing to change the behavior itself. And then in short order, the home fills up again, and then you're back to square one. And also and I can imagine it would be very emotionally even traumatic for someone to have that happen to them. Yes, absolutely. It's very traumatic. In fact, one of the things that we find, in addition to this sort of sentimental attachment to things and this notion of, of my identity, is is that objects come to form signals of safety for people who hoard. I can't tell you how many people we've seen with this problem who describe their homes as their cocoons or their bunkers against the world. Um, and any any attempt by anyone to, to touch, to move, to borrow, and worst of all, to throw away any of their things feels like a violation of that sense of safety. It's, and it's quite, quite dramatic. Um, many, many of the, of the women we talk to say that it, it, if someone's thrown something of theirs out or even imagining someone doing it, it feels to them as though they've been raped. So it's, it's a really dramatic violation of one's sense of safety. And so it's, it's traumatic if a health department comes in to throw things away. Are there and instances so we, where people have um, you know, committed suicide or gone into an extreme crisis as a result of, of having their stuff cleared out like this? Yeah, we, we, we have seen people who've committed suicide as a function of this. Um, also people who've end up having to be hospitalized uh, for, for uh, um, emotional behavior because of this. So it, is, it, it can be a pretty traumatic event for this to happen. I think I read something also that it can sometimes trigger confrontations and violence that someone will, they feel like their cocoon and their bunker has been demolished and they just kind of come out, come out fighting. Uh, that's right. Yeah. The other thing we see frequently in, the, in that context is that uh, people who hoard are often estranged from their family members. And it's, it's because what's happened is early on in the development of the hoarding problem, the family has tried to help. And, and families that are close go through this as well, where the family members um, are concerned about the person, their loved one, and they, and they really do want to help, but not understanding the nature of the situation, believe that what will help is if they go over and clear out the person's home. Um, and then they think that the, once they see how nice and, and beautiful this home is, they'll feel okay about it. But it doesn't happen that way. And, and so the, the result is that the person with the problem, the hoarding problem, then rejects the family and will not let them into the home. So you see people who have refused to let the family members in for 20 or 30 years because of these early events that have gone on. So people may really need some help, the families may really need some help, but all there is available often is, you know, kind of pressing the panic button and, and uh, calling the health department. And the health department, I mean, they're just there, you know, they have a very technical kind of approach to this, which makes a lot of sense. They're not counselors, they're not equipped to deal with family stuff they don't understand these kinds of um, dynamics um, what is it that is helpful and I know that one of the things that you wrote about I think is really good is is to think about it as a slow process that if a if a fire hazard for example or a health hazard is developed it's developed over a long time and so you can't just expect to just solve it immediately with one sort of fell fell swoop so what are some of the recommendations and approaches that you found have been effective in helping people who are in these really extreme kinds of situations well there, there are several approaches and and it, it depends on on the nature of the problem of course the the um, a therapy approach is certainly one that, w that we've been working on I'll talk about that in a minute uh, the other approach is is one taken by agencies uh, that are involved, and usually this is the health department and elder services and so forth. And over the last oh, five or ten years, uh, elder service agencies and health departments have become much more savvy about this problem. Uh, many of them, especially in the big cities, have recognized that the way in which they've been doing business hasn't worked very well, and they're having to go back for repeated 
um, visits to people who, who they've gone in and, and cleaned out. So uh, an, uh, across a number of cities in the U.S., there have been hoarding task forces created where people from the health department, people from elder services, people from housing, and mental health specialists have, have tried to create ways of dealing with these problems so that uh, it doesn't end up with the city going in and throwing out someone's possessions. So that's one, that's one thing that's happening. Um, and not that it's always uh, worked out well, but, but it's, at least it is a process that's ongoing now and, and has some promise of developing other strategies for people who won't attend or won't, won't go to treatment. In terms of treatments, um, we, we've developed a treatment program, Cognitive Behavior Therapy, for hoarding that is based on, on what we know works for other OCD symptoms, but it's, it's a little bit different. It's, it's tailored to match a hoarding problem. And there, there are several main features of it. Uh, uh, first is dealing with the acquisition problem. And what we find with people who have acquisition problems, that either compulsive buying or the compulsive acquisition of free things, is that it, during an episode of acquisition, it's, it's like one's attention is so narrowly focused on the item in question that the person forgets the context of their life. It's a little bit like, what I, uh, the way I describe it, it's a little bit like being hooked on a computer game where if you're playing the game, you forget about everything else in the room. You're just playing the game. You forget where you are. Sometimes you forget who you are. You're just in the game. That's what it's like for people who, who see something they want, to, they want to acquire. I was uh, thinking also just about the, the shopping spree phenomenon that people just exactly. start to get into a frenzy of, uh, I got I to gotta get this, I got to buy stuff. Exactly. And, and so that's a little bit easier for us to deal with in therapy. What we do is treat it like a physical fitness problem, where what we're trying to do is to teach people how to tolerate the urge to acquire something and just let the urge happen and not engage in the acquisition. So we start off uh, with actually two things. The first thing is if we get someone to go along with the person on the acquisition trip, it interrupts that process. There's someone there to bring them back, to bring the context of their lives back into their decision. And we know that they can't always, someone can't always be there. So one of the things we do is we have people create a list of questions for themselves that they need to ask themselves before they buy anything. And they carry these questions with them. And whenever they're about to buy something, they have to uh, answer these questions for themselves. And that works pretty well. The other thing we do is we set up a hierarchy of situations that are increasingly more difficult for the person to tolerate. And then we start with those that are low on the hierarchy, and we have them expose themselves to those urges. And then if they're successful, we move up the hierarchy. So we're basically training them in how to tolerate the urge. Have you seen people go from kind of a preoccupation with collecting and hoarding to finding ways of creative expression as part of their process of change? Yeah, and th that, that comes about in another part of the treatment, which focuses on their ability to manage possessions. And what we do in, in the treatment is some of the stuff that a professional organizer would do to help the person manage and, and make, um, make their possessions usable again. What, what happens with people who hoard is they collect all this stuff, but they never use any of it because they're always on to the next opportunity. But if you have it organized and you have it in such a way that it's readily available, then it's more likely that they'll be able to use it. So that, that feature of the treatment focuses much more on the organization uh, aspect than anything else. Randy, we are about out of time. Um, can you just um, give us some resources if people want to get in touch with you, if there are resources that people can look at on the Internet to find out more about your work and also about hoarding in general? Well, probably the best resource is the Obsessive Compulsive Foundation website. There's a special section of that website devoted to hoarding, and you can find some information there. Uh, another place you can go is um, the, the Anxiety Disorder Center, 
at Hartford Hospital. Go to the Hartford Hospital Institute of Living website and go to the Anxiety Disorder Center. And there, there's a special section on hoarding that um, I, my colleagues and I uh, um, have started the New England Hoarding Consortium, which is a, a group of us that have, that have been focused on doing our research on hoarding. And, and we collect um, uh, people on that website who, who want to have their name on a list so that they get some of the things that we've been doing, some of our reprints. We, we put together a newsletter about twice a year on some of the latest research on hoarding and what opportunities are out there for participating research and so forth. So if you want more, more information along those lines, go to the Hartford Hospital website to the Anxiety Disorder Center and follow the, the links to the hoarding uh, information section. Are there maybe resources out there for people who are not interested in the whole kind of disorder pathology framework who maybe want to have a more peer support group kind of framework or who want to see this connected to creativity and just sort of get it out of the normalizing uh, medical approach because I know that the, the Icarus Project, which is an organization that I work with, um, I, don't, I think there are a few people on the site who have struggled with hoarding and maybe people want to go to the forums there, they could start a discussion, but are there other resources like that that you're aware of? Oh, gosh, I, I, I'm, I, I don't know. There, there are uh, a variety of hoarding task forces across the country that have attempted to set up sub peer support groups for hoarding. Uh, we're doing some of that here in Massachusetts, but I don't know of any clearinghouse that talks about, uh, talks about that. And if people want to get in touch with you, your email address? Uh, I'm, uh, my email address is rfrost at smith.edu. Randy Frost, thank you so much for joining us today on uh, Madness Radio. All right. Thank you very much. You've been listening to an interview with Randall Frost. He has 15 years of experience working uh, with hoarding and uh, compulsive uh, collecting. He is a professor of psychology at Smith college in northampton massachusetts and he's written several books a treatment manual for therapists a self-help book called buried in treasures and his upcoming book is going to be for the general public thanks a lot for tuning in to madness radio um, we will see you next week you've been listening to madness radio voices and visions from outside mental health Madness Radio broadcasts every Tuesday, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern, on Pacifica Affiliates WXOJLPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD Kasilov and Anchorage, Alaska. Co produced by peer run mental health community Freedom Center.org and The Icarus Project.net. Madness Radio is hosted by Will Hall. Music producer is John Rice, with technical assistance from Jeremy Lansman. Listen to our internet stream, podcasts, and show archives at madnessradio.net. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness Radio, to help get us broadcast on a station near you, or if you just want to share what's in your head, contact radio at madnessradio.net.